Welcome to This Week in Missouri Politics. On the week the legislative session ends in this all-important political year, we brought together an opinion maker panel to discuss that, politics and everything else, starting with Jack Cardetti, guru, Democrat, elected more Democrats than maybe anyone else in the state, and the man from the smallest town in Missouri with two flag stores. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Ann Schweitzer, Republic ISTL. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Phil Cristofanelli, you're a name that is, is hard to say, but you're going to hear it a lot more. Running for state representative in what district in St. Charles County? 105th. And returning back to the show all the way from the Boot Hill in southeast Missouri, Russ Oliver, the prosecuting attorney in Stoddard County. Russ, glad to have you back. Glad to be here, Scott. Let's start with you, Jack. Paycheck protection. Uh, every Republican's talked about this for 20 years. They were so close. The House, the Speaker overrides a veto. Governor Nixon's veto stood in the Senate. What happened? Yeah, sure. Republicans and Democrats came together to protect workers in Missouri. That's exactly what happened here. You had um, Governor Nixon forcefully vetoing that, making sure everyone knew it wasn't good for workers, it's not good for our economy. If it was such a good idea, why did they exempt cops and firefighters out of it? I think that tells you what little protection it actually gave to workers. It was a deceptive move that the, it's been tried by the right wing for years now, hasn't passed, and that's good for our economy. Bill, this is an issue that every Republican's talked about for a very long time. Uh, Senator Crowell was on our show last week, and he made the argument that the, the states decided we're not going to divvy out money to the United Way. We're not going to divvy out money to this, and we're not going to divvy out money to your union. That seems to be an argument that made sense, but just not quite enough members went along. Sure. I think it's important to recognize this was a bill that affect only public sector unions. You know, yeah. in the private sector, employers and employees have different interests. In the public sector, the employees actually have an opportunity to elect their bosses. So they're negotiating for resources that belong to the people of the Missouri, and then we need the people of Missouri to have a voice at that table, and we do that through reasonable regulations of public sector unions like this. Russ Oliver, there is, would this have just been the first step, though? If the Republicans would have passed this, they said, well, no cops, no firefighters, nobody that wears a hard hat at work, it's only government employees. Would it, have, would it have got to the next, the, the trades after that, if they got their nose under the tent? Well, I, I think that regardless of, 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 of the outcome of that bill, this is front and center in the governor's race. Uh, and, and everyone uh, in that race has to take a, a firm position uh, where you stand on this issue. And, and that now that paycheck protection isn't a reality, uh, people have to take a, an even stronger stance uh, on where they're at, and uh, this is a, an issue that the voters are really going to get to decide. Do Republicans uh, want to make this election a referendum on labor? Does that work, work in the swing counties? Is that really how they want to pit the governor's race? I, I think that their base is going to make them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, th I think that in, in that primary, uh, this is an issue, uh, at least in my part of the state, that's front and center and that people pay attention to. Uh, and uh, the base is going to make uh, those candidates uh, say one way or the other, and it's going to decide the future of right to work, and it's going to decide uh, the future of paycheck protection in the governor's race. And Schweizer, it seems as though the Republicans crafted this legislation very narrowly to only affect AFSCME, SCIU, CWA. Those happen to be the unions that the swing vote, uh, Senator Chapon Liddell, those are the unions that she's, she's very vocal, <laughs> not liking unions, pointing out problems. Those are three unions she has a good relationship with. Do you think how narrowly it was crafted may have been what made it, them not be able to get her to stick for the override? Well, message is definitely key here, but there is nothing. This is not a, a bill that was for workers. This is not to protect workers. You know, the people who are out there trying to protect workers now are fighting for $15 an hour. So to say, it's deceptive to say that Paycheck Protection was going to protect workers somehow. They need a voice at the table. Unions are very important. That's something that I feel very strongly about. Jack, is it though, I, mean, I think it makes sense to some folks to say, you ought to have to agree to have stuff taken out of your check every year. Fundamentally, that seems to be an argument that, that might resonate with Missourians. Why does it not come through in the Senate? Well, sure. I mean, workers already have uh, a say over what goes into their check. You know, this was a strictly political move. This was trying to go after uh, uh, some of the more liberal service uh, employee unions. There's a reason that they exempted, even though they're public employees, fighter fires, law enforcement weren't in this bill. Um, and that just shows you how politically motivated this is. This isn't about giving workers choices. Workers already have choices. This is about going after and trying to, to force your will on those state employees who are the lowest paid state employees in the entire nation. 
They can't, we can't get lower than 50th. 50 is the dead bottom, and yet you're going to go after more of their money. Some will call 50th, actually, right where you want to be. But, um, do, do you think, though, there's a, there's a part of this legislation? There have been the trade unions, especially in St. Louis, that have moderated. They, they were known as very democratic. They still are very democratic, but they've certainly moderated. I think Roy Blunt sees some support coming out of the St. Louis trades. The AFSCME, SEIU, they have not moderated. And is that why they may have been focused in this, or was this just the way to get the first nose under the tent? We know that some elements of the Republican Party, the right wing, want right to work. And this is the first step in doing that. And, and, and you know, the, the service employee unions and the building trades have had each other's back on these two issues. They thought mm -hmm. if they could break one, that they would be able to topple the other. That didn't happen, and that's a good thing for Missouri. Rose Oliver, we just talked about the Roy Blunt, uh, probably the most successful family in Missouri Republican Party history. Matt Blunt, the only governor that's been elected since, what, I mean, like 1988 in Missouri, he was not pro-right to work. Do you, do you think the Republicans are missing something when you look at, if you, wouldn't you want to copy success? I think that uh, the, uh, what you see on, on the national stage is being replicated here in Missouri, that the Republican base is speaking out, and the Republican base has uh, an opinion uh, on these issues, and, uh, and I think that... Uh, that Did the that Republican the base speak out in 12? Did it speak out in 8? Did it speak out in 2000? Did it speak out in 96? Did it speak out in 92? And they didn't win. Phil, you'll be a, you're a rising star in the Republican Party. Do you not want to look at other successful Republicans and maybe say, hey, maybe we go down the path Matt Blunt went down. Maybe we go down the path where Blunt went down. Maybe not the path of all the folks that were on the other end of those elections. Sure. What's important for me is what my district cares about. And I'm in the process of going door to door, meeting every one of them one at a time. I've done 2,500 so far. And I'm learning more about where they're at on this issue. And that's really what's going to guide me most importantly. It's a close issue for me. Both of my grandparents were strong union men, and I appreciate the contributions they've made to the middle class. But at the same time, we're in a competition with 49 other states to be the best place to create a job and start a business. And sometimes we got to look at what other states are doing and make sure that we're still competitive. And so as election night 2014, if you were in the organized labor and you, were, and you looked at it, if you're a pipe fitter and you looked at the election returns, you had to think this was going to be bad. Even if this paycheck bill with this limited one would have passed, you'd have had to think, what a great deal. I mean, they've came out of this amazing, these two legislative sessions. I mean, I, I don't know how it could have went better for them. It's definitely not an issue that got further, and I appreciate that. So, I mean, so far we'll live to fight another day. Jag, labor's got to be bewildered that they've made it through. Well, it shows you what happens when you have a strong Democrat governor along yeah. with some uh, legislators who actually listen to their districts. If you look at a Sylvie and Romine, those are, those are districts that have real blue-collar sort of Reagan Democrats in them. And, and it shows you when you have that combination, strong Democrat governor and legislators that actually listen to their issues on, this, uh, on these type of issues, what happens. I think that's one of the reasons Coster is going to be so appealing uh, to candidates, uh, to, to voters in some of those collar and suburban counties. Let's just really quick talk about wrapping up the session in SGR 39 moves to the Senate the business community speaks very vocally doesn't move through the house uh, it almost leaked into the the companies that opposed it almost had blowback and some of the other issues didn't seem to be the tipping point in anything will the SGR 39 be an issue in urban St. Louis to motivate folks and, and is it an entree into the business community that's a very good question you know for SGR 39 I'm glad it didn't get any further than it did um, Religious bigotry is going to happen in this state and all over the country, no matter whether it's legal or not. So in my opinion, it should always be illegal. So I think that we're doing the right thing so far and proud of people who stood up against it. Jack, are, is, is there a trend here, Democratic strategists will tell you, that that, you know, 20 to, to 30s, younger professional, this is a way that the Democratic Party can make sure they keep them. You, sometimes you get more conservative as you get older. Is this a way they continue voting Democrat? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at Chris Coster's message at the end of the session, which is we've got to get back to business. You know, the culture wars here that we're fighting in Jeff City, they're not doing our economy any good. They're not doing our citizens any good. And they're probably at the detriment of the Republican Party in the long run. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer. I, I'm a Mark Twain Democrat. You know, I believe that no one's life, liberty, or property Mark is Twain safe when the legislature's in session. So I'm glad they're out of session. I think they ought to reevaluate the, what their values are moving forward. They continue to fight these culture wars. They're going to lose those young voters. Russ, is uh, Jack from, as David Stillman said, the smartest part of the state here? I mean, do a tax cut helps gay people, straight people, religious, non-religious. 
is there not a point where it's time to get back to the business of promoting business? And does Coster, is he where they, the, the state is on this? Well, I mean, despite some people using hyperbolic language, like religious bigotry, I really think that S SJ39 came from uh, a, 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 um, a genuine perspective. Uh, and, and I think that um, Senator Onder had good intentions, but good intentions aren't always conveyed to paper the way that they should be. And let's, let's be honest, SJ39, the way that it was written, was overly broad, would not pass constitutional muster uh, and passing an amendment uh, that um, uh, that religious um, uh, clergy and churches would rely on only to have it overturned pr gives protection to no one um, uh, and uh, it's unconstitutional because wouldn't you agree that um, solemnizing a, a wedding and baking a cake are, are two very different things uh, what we need in Missouri is a um, an amendment that is narrowly tailored to protect clergy and churches in history, and temples. Uh, in the history of statehood from Kansas to Illinois, has there ever been a preacher have to marry somebody? I mean, a shotgun wedding, the shotgun's trained on the groom, not the preacher. Well, it, like I said, there's a big difference between the, um, the, uh, the church that, that, is a, that this violates their doctrinal beliefs and, and a baker baking a cake. There should be some protection given to clergy and churches and temples and synagogues that violate their doctrinal belief uh, and that protection be extended Phil, to Phil, one time Ronald Reagan said the best social program is a job. Isn't maybe the best way to save a soul to give them a job? Absolutely. And don't you give them a job by cutting taxes and cutting government? Absolutely. That needs to be our focus. You know, when we lose elections, it's because we do not articulate an inclusive, solutions-oriented message that grows our party and makes us competitive in the 21st century. Uh, I think we need to talk more about the people we're here to help and less about the things that we're against, and that's what's going to be my maybe focus moving to, forward. Maybe to give your heart to Jesus Christ, maybe you ought to give him a tax cut first. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of things happen. Voter ID, Jag, is this, are Democrats going to be glad not to have to defend voter ID and it just become law? No, Democrats are always for allowing more people to participate in our actual democracy. That's kind of what we had when we started this country. And, and we've seen a systematic effort to try to prevent, in this case, it's going to be minorities, seniors, and the disabled uh, from getting to the ballot box. And we know there's 220,000 of them that don't have the proper ID right now. You, You've you said this ID? to me before. You've said this to me before. Yes, I do have an ID. Well, My me concern. Too. I have an ID. Excellent. We can both go and vote. My mama does. <laughs> and drive and all those things. But what's really important to think about is that anything that makes someone less likely to go to the polls is a bad thing. We want people to vote. So if me showing up to the polls without an ID and I go and I have to get my picture taken, stand in line longer, now it's harder to get to the grocery store, to the bus stop, or any other number of things, and I'm less likely to vote, that's a problem. Russ, that's you're going to have a problem. flood of folks that don't have IDs come to your office angry? No, no. Yeah, Bill, I mean... You have an ID, right? Absolutely. And if is anybody, this, I mean, most people think you have to have an ID anyhow, right? It's going to be news to folks you'd have to have one. But, but that bill didn't didn't prevent people, even if they didn't have IDs, it didn't prevent them from voting. All they had to do was sign an affidavit. Uh, it disenfranchised no one. Have you Jack, ever participated in an election in which someone had to actually go and sign something? It takes so much longer to have it done. In New Hampshire, they do have same-day voting, have, and that's excellent, and I'm so glad that they do that. I think we should consider that as well instead. Sure. Any any legislation that I want to see in my Missouri State House is going to be about how we can make it easier for people Where to vote. Every, 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 time that I've ever, every time that I've ever voted, I've had to sign. You have to sign the book that you come in uh, saying that, that, that you are you. You, don't, you have to read that whole thing. It does hmm. take time. This is something that we should be concerned about. I mean, this Jack, isn't... you mentioned a quarter million people without it. Yep. I'll bet you cold, frosty, Anheuser-Busch, there's not a quarter million fewer voters when this goes into law. No, sure, but if there's one fewer voter that has their constitutional right trampled on, that's something we oughtn't, ought not be in the business of. Speaking what we of ought to be able to do is make people uh, vote easier. We don't have early voting in, in Missouri. We don't have no-fault absentee voting. We don't have same-day registration. These are all things that would actually let more people participate in the process. The question is, why is one party here in Missouri want fewer people to be able to go to the polls? Speaking of though, that cold frosty Anheuser-Busch, you're going to have to buy me when that doesn't happen. <laughs> Big week for Senator Schmidt and Anheuser-Busch, the beer bill passed. A lot of effort went into this. It seemed to be 
a bigger push than many thought had to be necessary, but it came through and passed the legislature this week. Yeah, I think it shows a little bit uh, from the outside looking in. There, these craft brewers that you were seeing popping up over there, they, they, they may not be organized and have lobbyists and everything in the Capitol, but they have a pretty good grassroots. And, and while the big breweries were able to get this one passed, I think if you look at three, five years down the road, that may not be the oh, case. Oh, I think you see Boulevard hired Noel Torpy. I think you'll see a lot of people post-session mention the name Noel Torpy with the work he did for Boulevard to change that. And a big week for the brewery, right? Well, you know, I'm a St. Louis person. My grandfather was a union bottler at Anheuser-Busch. I have nothing but respect for that company. Um, I go into a beer cooler, no matter whose label's on it, I'm walking out with the forehand citywide because I'm a St. Louis girl, so. Phil, who are these people that buy single beers, though? I don't understand it. The, the cooler bill would let you let them lease coolers so you could buy beers. I don't understand that concept. Well, I think the reason that uh, Cornell introduced this bill is because he wanted more access to growlers and, and craft just get beer. the government out of it. Let you buy whatever beer you want. <laughs> well, r right now you couldn't have refillable growlers in convenience stores, and it's a new and cool thing. And St. Louis <laughs> and Kansas City are cool places to live. St. Charles. Russ, uh, as as a person like myself that has a son named Gussie, what a great day for the brewery, right? <laughs> Win for the home team. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get back to we'll, after the break. Come back and we'll talk politics, governor's race, presidential race. But first, we're going to leave you with this week's leading economic indicators. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Welcome back to this week in Missouri Politics. We cannot have Jack Cardetti on and not talk these initiative petitions that were turned in this week. Jack, give us the cliff notes on the medical marijuana initiative petition. Sure. So last weekend, uh, 275,000 signatures were turned in to make Missouri the 25th state that would allow doctors uh, to recommend medical marijuana to patients with serious and debilitating illnesses. This is an issue that really is popular in Missouri because of our libertarian strain. We know that we want doctors and patients to be making these medical decisions, deciding what the right treatment options are. If you have cancer, epilepsy, PTSD, and it's time we need to get big government bureaucrats out of that decision-making process. Russ Oliver, 
Why should the government care who smokes pot? Well, first off, calling it medical marijuana is disingenuous. What other part uh, in uh, medicine do we does the doctor say? You know what? Go down to the dispensary. You pick out the strength of the medicine that you want. Let's say it's hydrocodone or some other opiate. Uh, say you know you go down, pick out the strength that you want. You take as much as you want or as little as you want, uh, and you can take that dose whenever you feel like it or if you don't feel like it. Uh, nowhere else in medicine uh, is is anything prescribed in this in this nature and so to call it medicine in America is, is simply a falsehood uh, this is to use Jack's term when he was talking about um, uh, paycheck protection this is the the camel's nose under the tent to get full legalization of marijuana and then also to to scale back other drug laws in, in uh, response and you're a compromising person my thought would be get the government out of caring what you smoke and then cut taxes for what, what you've been chasing around for right Everybody wins. That, that's an interesting point. I'm, I'm more of the money. I'm more of the medical marijuana persuasion as well. Um, I've spent some time in Colorado and Washington State, and you know I think that with full legalization of marijuana comes um, brings a lot of people in who are interested in in legalized drugs, and so medical marijuana is kind of a step in the direction of federal legalization of marijuana in general. So I'm very supportive of medical marijuana, in Missouri. So there's a guy in Festus today working. How many more seconds should he have to work today to pay for the government to chase around people to care about what they smoke? Well, I'll tell you what we don't need, and that is the commercialization of another narcotic. Uh, we're still learning a lot about how this affects students and developing minds. I think Cheech I, and Chong may be mastering the commercialization <laughs> of the product. Sure. Uh, but when it comes to medical marijuana, I'm more open-minded. Um, I think that, that it's shown that it can help people with epilepsy, cancer, and bring them great relief. I just don't know that a ballot proposition is the best way to hash these issues out. I think it's best to do this in the legislature. We saw this coming. We should have written a bill that regulated this the way that the I'll legislators go ahead and saw that. Say, I think there's a lot of legislators that support this or really don't care, but they'd have to take calls from some constituent that didn't like it. So if it goes at the ballot, I think they'll be just happy not to have to deal with it anymore. They'll be thanking Jack, right? People send us there to lead and we should lead. There you go. That, that, uh, that we hope we got, we have this on tape, so you may have to come back in a year and we'll remind you that. <laughs> Let's talk about governor's race and uh, oh. heading out of the gate. It, it looks like until the ad wars start, Peter Kinder's probably the leading Republican. Okay. Right there with Catherine Hannaway. Is there a Republican that you don't want to face in November? Not really. I think Coster has it locked up. Locked up? Oh, that's I'm going to say locked up. I'm going to say locked up. We're, I'm going to say I, locked up. Phil, we're recording. I, that's great. Hello, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I do. I think he does. I mean, he's in a really great position right now where because he's running as the only Democrat in the primary, he doesn't have to pay attention to St. Louis or Kansas City, which I'm not a huge fan of because I'm a St. Louis person. So he can focus on, you know, a more middle of the road agenda like business, which we all love, obviously. I, I will venture to say Chris Coster spends more time off I-70 than any other Democrat in the state. Jack, is that unfair? No, Chris Coster, well, the, the interesting thing is he knows that there are certain issues in the state that unite everybody here. And, it, and really it is about improving our economy, improving our health care, and making sure we have quality schools. That's something that whether you're in urban St. Louis or you're in Palmyra, uh, they're going to care about. And that's one of the reasons that his message is, is working right, right now. Yeah, he's the only, Palmyra is. If, you're, if, if you're looking at it, he's the only adult in the room in this race right now, and that's his, to his benefit. Russ Oliver, that's from a man who's from a town with two flag stores in a small <laughs> town. Uh, I think that it is interesting when you see the Democratic candidate cutting a video saying it's time for the legislature to get back to the business of promoting business. That's not what you, that's scary, right? Uh, I mean, uh, Chris Gosper has a, has a wide, wide base of appeal and I don't think anybody can uh, deny that. I, I think that uh, the Republicans have uh, some good candidates. You picked a favorite yet? Um, you know, I, I think that right now uh, uh, Peter Kinder uh, has the lead, at least in the part of the state where I'm from. Uh, but Catherine Hanway is, is yeah. building in the infrastructure uh, that will pay dividends uh, later in the future. You're a prosecutor. I, I, I've seen some polling that shows this may be a law and order election. Mm -hmm. From the protests in Missouri, the ones here in Missouri for that Republican primary base, I think she's the best suited to be a law and order person. 
I, I think that, that that would probably be, be accurate, but um, also, uh, uh, at least in my part of the state, uh, Peter Kinder's um, sure. position on Ferguson uh, and um, his call uh, for the a action where we had inaction um, plays well in my part of the state. Phil, you from a part of the state where Bruner has some support? Yeah, there's a lot of Bruner supporters yeah. in St. Charles County. Uh, there's a lot of Catherine Hanaway supporters in St. Charles County as well. I think we have four highly qualified, credible candidates that are raising money and they're articulate, and any of them could give cost. You got a favorite yet? Money. I do not have a favorite. I love them all. You going to let us know first when you pick one? <laughs> I will let you know first. Uh, is it a little daunting, though, to see that you're, you've got four candidates and you've got a, the Democratic candidate is, is completely on their turf at this point? Sure, that, that's always a challenge, but we have such a large party in Missouri that we have a lot of leaders to draw from, and when you have that, you have primary. When you leave the legislature, okay. do you plan to take Chris Koster's advice and focus on business? Well, I don't know that that's, out the other I don't think Chris Koster invented the idea of focusing on business. That has been the Republican Well, I don't think anybody in the Missouri General time. Assembly this year invented it, that's for <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, let's talk presidential race. I've wanted, and now that we have you on the show, you were talking earnings tax last time we have you on. You've traveled this great nation supporting Hillary Clinton. Um, boy, it must have been tough to be motivated. In New Hampshire? Yeah, that was that was rough. <laughs> <laughs> that was painful. Well, they uh, sit in the A-team, I assume, there, because they knew it would be tough, right? Uh, yeah, I, thank you. That's very nice. Of course. Very nice. Uh, Donald Trump, what's your reaction? Oh, God. <laughs> well, I hope that, I mean, I, I hope that Hillary's ready. Uh, it's going to be one of the most important elections in our lifetime. Hillary Clinton was a key partner with her husband for his administration, right? Most of all the big decisions she was in the room for. That's what I hear. So, Jack Cardetti, um, she's in the room for all those decisions. How do you tell a union man when she was in the room in a big part of NAFTA, Donald Trump's actually going to try to save their job. Hillary Clinton's the one that was packing the boxes to send to Mexico. You know what that tells me? That tells me that Hillary Clinton's going to be able to pick up a lot of Republican support. I mean, Donald Trump is not he even on the face, same. Donald Trump's <laughs> not even on the same page as his party. He had to go to Capitol Hill this week just to try to kiss the ring so of Paul Ryan. All the Washington Democrats are for Hillary Clinton. All the Washington Republicans are for Hillary Clinton. I think in 2016, I'd be awful nice with the rest of the country. Well, what I think you're going to see is not. I mean, not only can Donald Trump, whose base is middle-aged white rural men, not only can he not. It's easy to win a Republican primary that way. It's almost impossible to is get to 270 that he doesn't get electoral the votes. Of Lindsey Graham, who endorsed about a half dozen other guys at all law. <laughs> I guess if he didn't get Lindsey Graham, he'd be down one vote in South Carolina. Yeah, but it's what. Who actually decides these races are suburban women and other yeah. voters like that. Hispanics out, uh, Hispanic voters out, out, out in the West. <laughs> Donald Trump has zero message to them, uh, and, and they're going to be as motivated as ever to get Hillary Clinton back in the White House. Russ Oliver, is there not? I mean, I know it's not taboo anymore to be a white heterosexual Christian male. That's the worst thing you could be. But is there not some of those folks that may turn out and vote to somebody that's going to save their jobs? I mean, we've all seen Nordine and Popper Bluff. I'm sorry, I don't see the Vincente Fox Industrial Park in Butler County, but we can get in a truck and drive to where those jobs in Nordine went to Guadalajara. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the one thing that is in this national race that re uh, resonates with people in my area more than anything uh, is the NAFTA discussion. Uh, I mean, the, the exodus of jobs from uh, from a towns like Malden, uh, from yeah. from Kennett, the empty factories I and the empty for Mexican storefronts. Come to Malden. No, uh, and, and the empty factories and the empty storefronts is heartbreaking. Uh, and anyone who visits those towns uh, can't deny Phil, that. Phil, just a few seconds left. You ready to make America great again? You know, it looks like he's going to be our nominee. He does very well with working class people. There's a lot of those folks in St. Charles County, and uh, I think that we're going to give them a run for their money. I'll leave it the prediction. I think Trump gets more votes than and, uh, Romney or Sarah Palin got. No, wait. And still loses? Be tough. <laughs> There's, the, it, there's only, there's 47%. No, I'm not even going there. We, but we will pick this conversation up all throughout the, uh, out the primary season. We'll be back here uh, next week on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, brought to you in part by Sterling Bank.